So can you tell us a little bit about the development of human diet? And I suppose that's very broad because, you know, we've got lots of people all over the world, but how you see it as an anthropologist and an archaeologist, mm -hmm. the development of human diet. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to lay this conversation out this way, because this is the piece of the conversation that's that's missing. Um, and today our, our attention spans are so short and we're watching, you know, 10 second TikTok videos and all this. We want answers to such a complicated question about how to nourish ourselves as, as modern day humans in that 10 second span. And none of it's that easy. So it, it, to me, as an archaeologist and anthropologist, looking into the past, the deep ancestral past, millions of year long past, is the only place that we can start to create that foundation of understanding about how to feed ourselves today. So yeah, I'll do a, I'll do a quick run through, but you, you nailed it um, when you said that there's so much diversity. I mean, it's hard to talk about, first of all, three and a half million years worth of time in just a few sentences. And it's also difficult to talk about, you know, even, even if... Um, that time period was easy to grasp all the diversity around the world in different pockets of, 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 of our ancestors living in different places, um, doing different things. So understand that what I'm going to say is a very generalized view of our past, very shortened and condensed, but I think um, it lays that, that foundation for us to have that understanding. So for anybody who says that our ancestors were either herbivores and or frugivores, they're a hundred percent right. But what they need to realize is that their bodies are complete, were completely different than ours today. They had completely different um, dentition. So their teeth were different. They had completely different digestive tracts, especially the size of their digestive tract compared to their body size. And their bodies and their brains were incredibly small compared to ours today. And all of that translates into our nutritional needs today are different than they were three, four, five million years ago when our ancestors were herbivores and frugivores. So let's start there. When our ancestors first stood upright about five to seven million years ago, which is where this conversation really should begin, um, we were upright walking, somewhat intelligent, somewhat culture having beings, but full grown adults are about three and a half feet tall and brains are about the size of my fist. So very low nutritional needs. And then uh, what we were eating at that time were a limited amount of wild fruits, a limited amount of wild vegetables and a bunch of insects. And of those three, the insects were certainly the most nutrient dense and bioavailable and the safest. Because if you think about it, and, and I know for many of us who get all of our vegetables from the grocery store, um, it's hard to visualize what a, a non-technology having hunter-gatherer ancestor had to deal with, but it wasn't like they just walked into the woods and started eating, right? Animals have specific digestive tracts and behavior patterns that allow them to consume different plants in a safe and nourishing way. Our ancestors really didn't. So number one, by default, they were take all the seasons out of the grocery store. They had they were eating hyper seasonally. They had no storage mechanisms. They were only eating what was available when it was available. And on top of that, they were so and hyper local. They had no shipping methods to you know transport things around around the world. And on top of that, remember that every single plant on this planet has some level of toxin in it. Um, and wild plants, especially, they're defending themselves through chemical and biological warfare. They had no means of detoxification like we have today. So every they were only eating hyper seasonally, hyper locally, and the and and the plants that were safe enough for them to consume with their very inefficient digestive tract and a whole bunch of bugs. So that's what they were eating then. At three and a half million years ago, there was a huge transformation. They created the first stone tool. And, and to make it, it takes less than a second to make. It's just banging two rocks together, the right material at the right angle. But what they created in that less than a second moment was transformative because now, now they were armed with this razor sharp edge, sharper and more durable than anything they had on their body. And for the first time ever, they didn't have to rely on what they had biologically to interact with the outside world. They could cut and slice and dice and butcher in ways they could never, in fact, they never could before that. And what we see at this moment at about three and a half million years ago is not only the creation of this tool, but also remnants of bones of animals that were killed by other animals, but show butchering marks from those stone tools. So we go from scavengers eating a little bit of plants and some bugs, I'm sorry, gatherers eating a little bit of plants and some bugs to scavenger gatherers where we're scavenging the remains of animal kills on the African savannah. Um, the important point there is that when a scavenger, uh, when a carnivore kills an animal on the savanna, then and, and now we know this by looking at modern behavior patterns of, of, of carnivores, 
They kill an animal and they don't sit there and like gnaw on the back leg. When they kill an animal, the first thing they almost always do is rip it apart and dive in and eat the blood, the fat, and the organs. They gorge themselves. That's the most nutrient-dense bioavailable part. Then they go off and digest that meal and they leave typically this very large carcass covered in meat for animals that are physically designed and behaviorally designed to scavenge to go in there and eat a bunch of that meat. So you're talking about things like hyenas and, 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 and buzzards. Our ancestors weren't equipped to do that until they made this tool. And that's exactly what they did. They would go in after these carnivore kills and use this stone tool to butcher and, and hack off chunks of meat. And then they, for the mm. first time ever, we started having meat in our diet. The interesting thing about that moment of three and a half million years ago was when we introduced meat into our diet, we don't see a whole lot of biological change. We don't see a whole lot of anatomical change. We see a little bit of body size growth. We see a little bit of brain size growth, but nothing dramatic. And there's probably two uh, reasons for that. One is that um, we maybe we weren't doing it that much. Maybe it only happened now and then and we were just introducing a little bit of meat into our diets. But if you look at the archaeological record and you see bones that are dating to three and a half million years ago with butchering marks on them, and we found numerous sites like this, you know, the, the amount of those sites that it, were created that are no longer in existence must have been incredible to have just the few there for us to find. So I think it was happening on a somewhat regular basis. I don't know how much of a change it really made in our diet, but we were they, it was happening. The second thing is that even though meat is in, so much more nutrient dense and bioavailable than any plant we have on the planet, it is the least nutrient dense and bioavailable part of an animal. And that's exactly why the carnivores would go after the blood, the fat, and the organs first. But our scavenging ancestors didn't have access to that because the carnivores ate those parts. The most transformative change happens at 2 million years ago when our ancestors create two incredible technologies. One, fire, control of fire so we could cook and detoxify our foods. And uh, to me, even more importantly, the, the, the technology and the development of hunting. So now we were no longer scavengers. We go from um, gatherers, scavenger gatherers to hunter gatherers where we're the predator, we're the carn. You know, we can go in and, and, and we, we can kill an animal and we have first access to any part of that animal that we want. So we can then eat the blood, the fat and the organs and also the flesh if, if we choose to do so. It is at that moment, at about 2 million years ago, that we see the hugest, the biggest, most transformative jump in body and brain size in our three and a half million year long evolutionary past. And I'm convinced that part of that is because the incredible nutrition that comes from the having access to the entire animal helps support that massive body and brain growth. Then, you know, everything that we're doing, we just over the next, you know, two million years, just find better ways to do it. We're hunting better. We're trapping better. We're fishing better. We're butchering better. We're using great, all parts of the animal better. We're finding ways to detoxify vegetables. The fact that we, we were never just eating meat. We were eating massive quantities of meat and animals, but we were also eating vegetables. But the, the, we were creating all sorts of technologies that allowed our body to have safe and efficient access to the nutrients in those vegetables. And then everything changes at about, and I'm hit, certainly just hitting the hallmarks here, at about 12 to 15,000 years ago with the development of agriculture. And where we develop agriculture, there's massive change. Mm. Number one, we go from eating, we're estimated, hundreds of different plant, uh, animals, hundreds, I'm sorry, hundreds of different plants and dozens of different animals. And remember the entirety of those animals on a yearly basis down to focusing our diets on one or two annual grasses. And depending on where you are in the world, it could be rice in Southeast Asia. It could be barley or wheat or einkorn or whatever in, in the Fertile Crescent area and in, in Europe. It could be maize in the Mesoamerica. Depending on where you are, you have um, different individual crops filling that, that niche. But those are almost always annual grasses. They require a tremendous amount of effort to uh, prepare the fields, to plant, to tend, to harvest, to store, and the entirety of our culture and our diets transform almost overnight when we focus on that on that one annual grass. And then on top of that, not only do we lose all that diversity and that incredible nutrient density and bioavailability, but we lose a lot of safety. There's all sorts of toxins that now are flooding into our diet like we've never had before on an almost daily basis. And so, you know, we go from, again, just to recap, we go from gatherers to scavenger gatherers to hunter gatherers to food producers in the agriculture revolution. And then the next big transformative change happens in the 1700s 
where we go from um, food producers to most of us are food consumers, where um, in the industrial revolution, most of us are involved in factory work or something else. Other people are working massively hard to not only um, grow our food, but to create it and package it and ship it and make it available to us Mm -hmm. in a somewhat convenient basis. In in those last two cases, not only does our um, nutrient density and bioavailability and safety go down, but one of the things that I think is incredibly um, uh, problematic is that our connection to our food, um, you know, we get more and more distance from our food. There's more and more links put in our food chain. And, and most of us today not only know, you know, where our food comes from, but we know nobody involved in that food chain. We don't know mm-hmm. who's growing it or butchering it or killing it or packaging it or cooking it or shipping it or even putting it on a shelf in a grocery store. And that's where the real problem comes from. We think we know now more about food than we ever have. And I think on a chemistry and biological um, perspective, we do. Mm. But the reality, but we don't know anything about our food. We don't, we, we hire people to tell us how to eat. It's a, it's a question we've never had to ask before. Mm. It was always answered by our parents and our grandparents and ourselves and, and trusting our own bodies. And now mm. we are so distanced that we are in a problem where we have to, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be on this podcast with you, but we have to have podcasts mm. that teach people how to eat. 